Hello everyone, Bree Seeley here with the Big Goal Energy Podcast. I am just thrilled for today's episode for a few reasons. First off, this is the first roundtable podcast episode I've ever done. And I went into this experience having no idea how it was going to work out, what I was doing, how to even prep the women on the episode with me. And this episode that you're about to witness is really powerful and really meaningful. After we hit stop, all of the women were like, I actually learned a lot from this episode. So um, I'm just really excited for you to experience it. So let's dive in a little bit. What do we talk about on this episode? Well, me and all three of the guests in this episode are talking about building a business around your life. Now, I think to a point we're all kind of taught from the beginning, like this is how you should build a business. This is what it needs to look like. These are the kinds of revenue streams. These are the kind of goals you need to have. And what the four of us talk about is that we walked that path. We walked that journey. We did all the should things. We built the businesses that we were supposed to build. And all of us had moments where we realized that our life was more important than our business. And we had to make some really important changes to our business. What's interesting is I didn't know all of their stories when I asked all four, all three of them to be, what's interesting is I didn't know all three of their stories when I asked them to be on this episode and the four of us have all had very similar journeys around how we got to the point of knowing that our life was more important than our business and how to shift and redesign our business to be in alignment with our life. So stay tuned and welcome to the inaugural roundtable episode of Big Goal Energy, the podcast. I can tell you've got big goal energy. Are you ready to turn your wildest dreams into your everyday reality? You are in the right place. Welcome to Big Goal Energy, the podcast that helps you turn your audacious and delusional dreams into your everyday life. We know that you don't settle for the ordinary, that you have dreams which others may deem unrealistic, but here we help you defy reality and bring those dreams to life. Each episode of Big Goal Energy empowers you with knowledge, inspiration, and mentorship to conquer your most unrealistic goals. From transparent roundtable conversations to short form episodes, you'll hear the experiences of women who have defied reality, as well as learn practical tips and strategies to fuel your journey. Join us by subscribing to Big Goal Energy, and together we'll turn your audacious dreams into remarkable achievements. Welcome to the Big Goal Energy podcast. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with all of you today. Let's go around quickly so everyone can briefly get to know each of you. And if you'll tell me who you are and then briefly how you've built your business to fit your lifestyle. So Jess, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Happy to. My name is Jessica Belsky. I've been a entrepreneur for nine years now, almost 10. I'm a transformational life coach and hypnotherapist. I work with what I call our high performing seekers. And I have a methodology called subconscious harmonics that helps create a harmony between the conscious and the subconscious mind. I do embodiment work. My mastery is in emotional processing, communication, subconscious reprogramming. And I also just launched a second company with a business partner, which I'm very excited about, called Proactive Conversations, which is a communications training and coaching company that's designed for organizational settings for teams and leaders to help companies cut down on workplace drama and have more connected, inclusive, and trusting conversations. And on top of that, I am a mom of a six and a half month old, my first baby, which is something I never thought I would ever say. I never thought I would have a kid. And I met my husband and everything changed. My business had many faces, many iterations, many versions over the last nine years. And it's always changed in response to what's happening in my life, whether that was at one time having a business partner and trying to scale and then losing a business partner was my ex-husband and then scaling on my own and building big team and then firing the team when I went through my divorce so that I could just kind of incubate and heal. And then ironically, finding more profitability and then running my business in that way for a long time. And now, you know, being a mom, running my companies and trying to find the balance between motherhood and parenting and and running a business and my 
old version of me and my now new version of me. And I've always built my business around my needs. Like for example, for two and a half, three years, I only took coaching sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I did not work at all Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I had a multi six figure business that way. And it's just because I like to have freedom and I wanted to travel and have the room to do my other hobbies like jujitsu and whatnot. And then, of course, now as a mom, there's more dynamics at play around designing my business around my life. I have a nanny who's here Monday through Thursdays, for example, and that's one of the ways that I give myself support and I can go into more details. But that's just at a high level, a little bit about me. Thank you, dear. Let's hop to Jordan next. Yes. I'm Jordan Gill. I am in Dallas, Texas. You know, Texans, we got to say we're from Texas. I have been in business for eight years and like Jess, had very many, many iterations in my business. Started out with monthly retainers, moved very quickly into VIP days because I burned out on monthly retainers. And everyone was like, why do you have such a spacious life? And I was like, because I only do four clients a month for four days and then the rest of the month is mine. They all wanted to be taught. So then I spent about two and a half, three years doing a group program called Done in a Day where we had 600 students go through it in two and a half years. What? Yeah, collective deep breath for that. And it was amazing and also a lot. Grew to a team of 12, similar to Jess, big team. Descaled it last year in 2023 and uh, back down to myself, by myself, uh, which is really different and cool and interesting and awesome. Uh, all at the same time. And yeah, just a lot of healing going around that. Still doing VIP days one on one, but also now playing around in the micro tool world. So I am creating different ways to really simplify and streamline online business owners, how they run their business, what kind of marketing they're doing optimizing their sales, all the fun little gadgets and gadgets. I built my business around my life because I had to. I was diagnosed with three chronic illnesses, which really dictate my schedule, my actions and all of that. I've always had to be really, really conscious of how much I'm working because I will burn out very easily and go into chronic flare ups uh, with pain. So, you know, that's definitely affected how I've shown up. I also wed into an Insta family, so to speak. So I met my husband husband, got married. He has a son. Uh, he's 10 now. And that has iterated from when we first met, it was 50-50 custody. And now about two years now we've been full custody, you know, entering into motherhood full force, which is amazing. And also like what is happening, but I'm, I'm trying to balance it all and, and still have time for awesome work and, and an awesome life too. Thank you. Sheena, you want to go next? Hi friends. I'm Sheena Jean. I have a company called Make One Day Happen. I am a Beth with helping leaders, founders, and teams get really clear on what's holding them back from getting to that next level of their leadership performance and growth. I have seen also many iterations of my business as well. I started in 2017-ish, I would say. And I'll actually tell you straight up, I it has taken me a long time to recognize that I was building a business around my clients instead of building a business around me. That has wreaked a whole lot of havoc in my life. I took on a project out in Phoenix, Arizona back in 2021 with one of my best friends. We co-founded a wellness-based social club together and opened that. And uh, about a year into it, hit functional burnout. It was brutal. Had to close the business and the community. And ever since then, I would say like that is the thing that forced me into like, oh, if my business isn't actually like serving and supporting me first and foremost, then it's never actually going to work. That's where my pivot has come in the last, I would say, two years is really recognizing that I get to put myself first. And in doing that, I can serve and show up so much better. The last two years has been really interesting. I think so much of the entrepreneurial world is like build, scale, grow, go, eh, type of energy. And I've been consciously saying no, moving really, really slow, pausing, listening intuitively. I also work with people on their energy, their thoughts and their visions. And so helping them take care of their energy hygiene, helping them reprogram subconscious thoughts and clarifying visions. And so really just been in my own process as well and not coming to the pressure of feeling like I need to get out there before time and giving myself the time and space to heal from burnout. That's a like it's actually not a buzzword. I thought it was a buzzword. Yeah thought it was a buzzword. It's not an actual condition. And I really taking the time to repair and set my business up in a way coming back into it that it's more like I kind of think of like fast fashion versus slow fashion. Like how can I build a slow business? 
how can I build something that is just like super juicy that I enjoy doing? But as soon as I start to feel that twinge of like, like pause and I put it down and I go do something else that better supports me being balanced. I am by no means an expert at this whatsoever, very much still in my journey of figuring that out. It's been an awakening to my workaholism and recognizing how I think society is really like that's an ism that society actually glorifies. Workaholism is really like a badge of honor in our society. So I think it's that it's also very deeply ingrained in my own family. And those patterns have been something that I've been getting to unwind and be with. And as we all know, that's that's a fun ride. Yeah. Um, for those of you that don't yet know me, I am Bree Seeley, the entrepreneur coach. I work with hella ambitious women who are overworking and underliving to help them defy reality and bring their most audacious goals to life through working less and living more, which I feel like was kind of a theme that all of us touched on in each of our intros. My journey started 17 years ago. I ran my own fashion label for eight years, and that was not a business that was designed to fit my life. I tell people that, you know, I had one of my sewing machines alone, I think weighed like 300 pounds, not to mention all my other machinery, my equipment, my stock, my supplies. I had an office in the fashion district in downtown LA. My schedule in my life was very much dictated by my business rather than the other way around. Really, truly part of why I shut that business down was because I was so miserable. In hindsight, learned later what my top core values were. And my top core value, like Sheena mentioned, is freedom. It was very obvious once I realized that why fashion could not stay in my journey. I shut my business down overnight and ventured into the unknown with a very expensive business coach that I had just hired 48 hours prior and set forth to figure it out. Within a week, realized that women had been asking me to help them do what I had done in my business for the last eight years. So I said yes. And then that began... Um, I'm a virtual business hipster because way before it was cool, like well, pre-pandemic, I kicked myself in the ass in 2020 that I hadn't bought stock in Zoom. Yeah. Even today, I'm in Nashville. My fiance happened to be coming to town and I was like, cool, I'll just hop in the car with you. I get to do what I want, go where I want. I have a very full schedule this week. It's not like I'm here just like messing around because one of the things I see with women is that they're just missing out on so much. They're forsaking their life for their business and... Well, Sheena said she's not an expert. Part of the reason that I specifically invited the three of you on is because I watched each of you do this in your business. If you're perfection, probably not. And each of us are, are way further along than most of the women I talk to. Pardon this quick interruption. One of the biggest challenges ambitious entrepreneurs face is closing the gap between where they are and their big, big goal. I've created a resource for you that will help you navigate the journey more easily. Defy Reality, the Female Entrepreneur's Guide to Achieving Her Audaciously Ambitious Goals will guide you through a process to 110% claim the inevitability of your big delusional goal, banish your doubts, and identify the exact steps you need to take to defy reality. Visit breeseely.com slash free to get immediate access to this tool that will help you stop wasting your time so you can start defying reality. And now, back to your episode. One of the things that I feel like was a really consistent thread between all four of our stories was this idea that there was like this external pressure, or some sort of societal, this is how it's done, that kind of caused mm -hmm. all of us to go into a path that we then had to realize like wasn't our path. I heard it from all three of you, and I know it's part of my story as well. What do you think was the moment where you started seeing that what was told to you that should be done in business was like not actually the thing that fit you? It was like fitting a square peg in a round hole. Rushing. Got it. Uh, and if Jared, you happen to listen to this podcast, I love you. However, this was a defining moment for me when my co-founder was like, burnout is inevitable. If you're actually doing it right as a startup, burnout's inevitable. And there was this like, visceral, oh, fuck. 
what have I gotten myself into? And he comes from VC, worked with Steve Case of AOL for a long time. Literally one of my best friends, but definitely, definitely like his dad's a Kentucky lawyer. And like he just is very steeped in probably systems that he can't even quite see for himself. And I was like, oh, shit, this is is this really what you believe? Like if you believe that burnout is inevitable, like we're fucked. We can swear Swear away. Swear away. We speak French. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow. Like, that is not good. That's not good because that means he's taking that energy on for himself. And in hindsight, I see it much more clearly. In that moment, I remember thinking like, oh, this is probably not going to work out great. And it didn't. It didn't. And it was like the most cosmic universal like, this had to happen to get me to where I'm at today like I had to go through that a lot of us might relate to that experience of like yeah it really sucked at the time however now I'm so crystal clear on who I am and what I'm here to do and how to serve and show up in a way that does put me first versus this business or this person that's telling me burnout's going to be inevitable in this journey it's like oh okay Great. Yeah. Well, I think it's too the rhetoric around seven figures. For me, I'm a very intrinsically motivated person. The seven figure conversation is cool. Great. If you want to have seven figures, amazing. I've done it. Cool, cool, cool. It helped me land my dream house that I'm getting into with my husband. And I always had this understanding around the seven figures that I was making seven figures because I had a very specific goal for that seven figures, which was to buy the dream house that my husband and I want to be in. And then what was interesting is when that happened and I got the house, then all of a sudden I felt so disconnected to the seven figures that then I just realized like, actually, I don't I don't want all this anymore. So that's when the height of done in a day was going on. And we had just brought in, I think, 80 clients in like a two week span during our launch. It was mayhem. And my coach had just left me and like, <laughs> and, you know, I think so many people want the seven figures, but for what? Had I known how, and I don't want to say short lived, but because done in a day was a very specific two and a half, three years of my, my business career, my life, it would have been helpful for me to have known beforehand, like, okay, like you want to build this to a certain point and also it's okay to then feel complete in it versus continue to chase up the path because I think too it's like okay well once you have seven you want eight and once you have eight you have nine and then it just like keeps going and I'm like I actually don't want all that that's not my story that's not my thing it's cool it's awesome I applaud everyone who has been able to accomplish that and I want, again, that that freedom. And I think, too, around before done in a day, like I did only work with four clients a month. Like I had four days that I was on with clients and the rest of the month was pretty much mine. And I looked around at a bunch of my friends who were making way more than me at the time and thinking, oh, they're doing the webinar to the course, to the thing, to the thing. Me being like, oh, that's what I should be doing. Like, that's what I'm supposed to do as an online provider. Again, it's a great business model, not knocking it. And I had way more freedom than they did. Even when I was at Seven Figures, I understood there are people who have way more freedom than I do right now because I'm responsible for so many people's livelihoods, which I took very seriously. And I actually really did enjoy my team. But recognizing what your definition is, is so crucial because once you start to then hear messages, because you're going to, it's noisy. Once you start to hear messages and it's like, oh, like this message actually isn't for me and that's OK instead of feeling like, oh, should I adopt that message? Should that be what I'm doing or whatever else? Making sure that you know what your definition is so that way you don't get easily swayed and distracted by all the noise. I resonate with both of you guys a lot. I'm trying to figure out even where to start. There are times when you make the decision and there's times when the decisions are made for you. For me, the decision was kind of made for me. I was also, like you, Jordan, I was doing that scale to seven figures, driving up the mountain, why I don't know, but because I was told to kind of thing. And I was just like building the team. And I had like, I went from having no overhead to having like $25,000 a month in overhead. And I'm like, oh my God, like, but I got to keep making the money. And I was like, I got to fill the course. You know, my, my business is worth to wealth. That That's the name of that company. And I was running a group program and filling the group program. And then I was like, and now I got to make this evergreen. And then I got to do this. At the same time that I was scaling my company, my marriage was falling apart. My first marriage was mm -hmm. falling apart. My ex-husband had a substance-induced psychotic break. 
and ended up going into rehab and then sober living. And I was having a massive personal awakening around my own codependence and what is the nature of relationship. I was pouring my entire being into the business as a way of trying to have a sense of control in my life when everything felt like it was falling apart. I was working with the coach at the time and I was burning out and I was on that path downward. I mean, I was working 15 hour days, hardly sleeping, also going through this insane journey. And he looked at me. And by the way, it's important to know that before that, my ex-husband and I had been business partners. And I mentioned we stopped becoming business partners, but we had gone broke together while traveling the world and living in Spain. We just like literally bottomed out to negative $750 in our bank account in a foreign country with maxed out credit cards, like nightmare situation. I was like, I will never be in that position again. I realized that my shame that I carried was the reason why the business even went to that place. It's a different story. But I think that I had decided to prove something to myself at first when I was healing around that. And then it became an obsession. And then it became a control. And then that blended with this societal programming around scale your company, reach seven, eight, nine figures. Then my coach was like, well, what would happen if you just let it all fall apart? And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, just like literally let it all fall apart. And I was like, but I just got my shit back together. You know, I was then, you know, he's like, well, maybe, maybe just try, let it fall apart. And I was like, okay, fuck it. So within like a week, I fired everybody, which was hard. I didn't have full-time employees, but they were all people who were depending on me. And so I fired my agencies. I fired my contractors. I fired my coaches. I only kept my virtual assistant. I let it all fall apart. And the irony is that's when I went back to private work and ended up making way more money. And I joked around for years and said that I was semi-retired at the age of 36 because I worked two days a week for like seven hours a week, if that, and traveled the world and would go to Europe and take my business calls and coaching sessions while I was in foreign countries. It ended up completely transforming, turning around for me. I co-created with the universe and myself that pressure cooker of a situation because I continued to make choices that abandoned myself. I abandoned myself in my marriage. I abandoned myself in my instincts around my work. And that culminated and led to this place where ultimately I had to abandon everything else so that I could come back to myself. So that's sort of how it unfolded for me. And now as a mom and a new business owner again, I'm asking new questions again. It's And I don't know Jordan, if you resonate with this too, but it does feel like your thrust, the role of mother, however you come into it, it's like a massive identity mm -hmm. change. And there's a reconciliation of old and new and shedding and ego death in a way. It's been another opportunity. And I decided to start another business when I was three months postpartum. And there are some days where I'm like, why the fuck did I do that? Why the fuck? Oh, that's right. Because I was looking for an opportunity to remember who I was. But now, mm -hmm. some days, I don't feel like I'm showing up for my business partner. There's like lots of times, I think, in life where you're given the opportunity to come back home to yourself and ask again, who am I and what do I really want? And am I willing to let it all fall apart or let it go so that I may have that thing that is ultimately really emanating from me? Yeah. Jess, I had a question about your, like, when you let go of your team, because I think that probably for me was one of the hardest things out of everything that happened. I'm curious if, too, with societal views of that, that seems to publicly look like, oh my gosh, she's lost herself. She's going nuts or whatever. And also this idea of, oh, she can't keep a team. So what's wrong with her? That kind of rhetoric. I don't know if that ever played into your decision or you already had been so far like, fuck it, I'm just going to do it anyway, that you didn't really sit there and marinate with like kind of those societal no, Bonds. definitely. That definitely came there for me, too. Yeah, I I'm with you, girl. I was like, what are people going to say? think about me. Does it look like I'm failing? I can't hack it. To your point, Sheena, I can't be that boss ass grinding entrepreneur that goes to like their dust, you know what I mean? Or whatever. Like that's the masculine narrative around business. And I was like, people are going to just think that I gave up or something or that I wasn't making enough money or whatever. I don't know about for you, Jordan, but like for me, I mean, Sheena too, you had a business that sounds like you closed down also. Yeah. And Brie, like, I'd be curious to know, I nobody really gave a shit. Mm -hmm. And I, if anything, people were really curious about my decision to do that then then later told them why and then i 
thrived afterwards. They were like, well, I want to do that. But actually ended up being something that people found inspirational. But at the time, yeah, I think I was yeah. very worried about what people would think. I had one person who, as it turns out, just was like not a great person who was subtweeting about my failures and stuff on Twitter back when, you know, Twitter was a thing. I also recognize that her saying what she said was simply a direct reflection of things that I was already questioning within my. What I had to do when I closed my business is I had about a nine month period where I was concurrently grieving and recontextualizing what had happened while also building this new business. I really had to come to grips with what is the difference between failure and the courage to walk away from something that's no longer working for you. That was a process. And so she was reflecting back to me my expectations or my narratives around failure and what are people going to think if I failed. I had to then do the work inside of really owning the fact that it wasn't failure. It was actually a courageous move. I don't think anyone else can resonate with that at all. That hit a lot. And I wish I could say that nobody cared about the business that I closed. That was not the experience that we had. And it was a much different model. It was a live brick and mortar community space that was hosting 25 events a month and providing oh. a complete social network for folks. And how it got closed was three weeks of like, hey, this is shutting down in three weeks. And it wasn't my decision or it was handed the here's the close it down plan that you get to execute. And so there was a lot of pushback from community members. And why is this happening? Well, ultimately, it was me who was walking away. I was trying to tell the other owners like this isn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. This is not how we're going is not going to be a long term model. And I need to bow out by August. And they're like, well, if you're not in, then we're just going to close it all down. Like, again, this is why this is not sustainable. It was this whole crazy situation, y'all, where I exactly what you said, Brie, is like, this is me continuing to choose to put other people before myself and before what I know that I want and desire. That whole year, I had pushed off every single vacation that I had. I was taking one day off a week to like drive down to Tucson, get some body work and chiropractic work done to like barely stitch me together and then come back into it. I had booked a sound healing training and a trip to Mexico. And then all of this kind of hit the fan. And they're like, OK, still go to Mexico. Like, you want, you want me to go to Mexico and like sit on the beach while you close down the community that I built? That's not going to happen. So I'll cancel another trip. And I'm not canceling. This, these four days, I am untouchable. You can't, you can't get a hold of me. The first day of the sound training is when they decided to send the email out to the community. There's members in the sound training. I can like remember just like this visceral, like insane, like trying to hold everything in because the, it was the withholding and not being able to tell people what was actually going on and having vendors and facilitators and members asking, where's the schedule for next month? And it just came erupting out when that email hit. And to have to also hold the pain of everyone losing this thing that, that they were losing while also like keep a face on and you know what it's like to operationally close down a business it's not fucking easy like there's a lot of admin and the steps alone from the workload not to mention the emotional weight that it carries and the identity that it's tied into and then when you're in business with a community and it it different in real life as well like there is a difference which is why i'm like okay let me go, let me go try my hand at this online thing instead so it was really challenging season and it's taken, it's actually two years that we closed it last month and last year was crazy what would happen and my body collapsed on me on a few key days that tied into that and going back to different community members, they have such a different perspective of it now that it's not so in their face, but it was one of a lifetime breaking karma of walking away from something that was not serving me. Like it wasn't a fail. Like, yes, were there things about the business model that were unsustainable? It wasn't going to work unless we majorly overhauled it and infused some cash into the thing. Definitely. So was it headed toward failure? Yeah. Was it more the opportunity for me to finally like choose myself before choosing someone else? It was absolutely more of what it was because just like you were saying, I taught myself how to self-abandon in protection at age five. I'm really fucking good at it really good at it i did it in a marriage that also felt like it so this has been like there's so much resonance here with everyone's stories around when is it 
time to like really recognize that we get to choose ourselves first and foremost, and that it is possible to create businesses from that mindset instead of anything else that we've been taught or has been put on us. I'm super curious. We've all talked about, we recognized what building a life around our business looked like. And we all had physical sensations, emotional, mental, like all these things telling us this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it. Then we all pivoted. We found that point and said it's time to walk away. How did you all start then moving into, so Sheena, you just said, picking myself. For me, it was aligning with my core values. What did you guys start doing that was different in the second act or the next act after the walking away? Mm-hmm. I hired God. <laughs> like I made God my wow. co-founder, honestly. And kind of like just when you said I'd never thought I was going to be a mom. I never thought that I would ever (laughs) say something like that. And I recognized that I had been just taking on so much myself versus opening up to a higher power that infinitely knows better than what I'm doing. Like, how can I really connect and tap into that profound level of faith, of trust, of being provided for and knowing that I'm moving in alignment with that versus like uphill grind and push and trying to do it all myself and figure it out myself. That's been honestly the thing that has truly shifted for me. Oh, that like, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jordan. Oh, no. Yeah. You, you, you got. Okay. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say, too. That hit me super hard. I was going to say pretty much something almost very similar. I was going to say I focus on my healing and my, my healing was so much about my spiritual journey. And it was also about this deep emotional work, like deep shadow work, deep fucking shadow work, like, whoo, like on the floor and in fetal position many, many, many nights for many, many months because I went to my knees. And when you go to your knees around something like that, there's nowhere to go. But uh, like you can't you can't grasp on to the things that you used to know. You have to turn it over. I also felt like that. I felt like I turned over. And it's funny because now in my life as a mom, I'm going through this other transformation. And I notice that it's when I drift from my spiritual connection, that's typically the red flag or the yellow flag. When I start to drift from my practice, it's, just, it's like where I should be like, wake up. But I most of the time miss that until one day I'm like, smack. And then, and then I'm like, oh shit, I haven't meditated in like six months. Whoa. And I suddenly realize it. So yeah, I I mean, I love that. I hired God. That's so good. I love that. Love it. Again, we think that one, we all think our problems are ones that nobody else has ever, at least that's (laughs) how I was. Nobody else has ever had to do this. How silly of me. I was in a pure mastermind at the time. And when I was like, I'm going to let go of my entire team, like it just... I can't hold it anymore. There was a lot going on personally and there was a lot going on business-wise where it was like, okay, I shut down my program, which was 90 to 95% of my revenue. And so then I was having to try and think on the fly and quick to figure out what that next thing was in order to uphold the team that I had that was causing way more stress than necessary. It caused a lot of unworthiness on my end. My husband just looked at me one day in May 2023 and just was like, why are you talking to yourself like this? Like, I don't even recognize who you are right now because you're acting like you're like the worst business owner ever, that you're the only one who's ever had to do this or that you won't be able to bounce back from this. And like, it just got really heavy for me when I talked to my peer mastermind about it. They were all like, oh, yeah, like we've done that. Like, you'll be totally fine. And they weren't being passive about it. They were just being like, yeah, yeah, like this is, you've been in business like eight, nine years. Like this makes sense. Like this happens. And again, it wasn't passive. It was just very, this makes sense. Like this happens to everyone, quote unquote, or a lot of people. And it's like, oh, well, let me not, let me not create a a mountain out of a molehill sort of thing. And not to take away the depth of hurt. It helped to remind me this isn't the end. Like this isn't going to totally consume over me and I'll never be able to figure it out again. I've been figuring out an entrepreneurship for seven years at that point. Why would I think this would be the thing that took me down when there was other stuff that could have taken me down? That's really what allowed me to retool and rethink how I then found this next act or next moves because it was not allowing that 
depth of pain to then completely stop me from whatever was next as if I couldn't impact people again and the drama around it that I was creating. It was definitely hiring God and definitely talking to other people about it. Because also, like, if you talk in a room full of, again, we have seven, eight, nine, however many years in business, we all get it. There's not this. And I think sometimes when you get into rooms of like newer entrepreneurs, that's more of where the judgment comes in because they're like, oh, my gosh, you couldn't figure it out and you couldn't make it work. But anybody who's gone through some years and gone through some stuff are like, yeah, can relate, you know, and it's not a knock on the newer entrepreneurs. It's that you just haven't dealt with the depth that we have dealt with yet. So you can't possibly know the types of decisions that we're having to make because of X, Y, Z that we have going on, you know. And I think the difference is it's not that we couldn't figure it out. Right. It's that we decided we didn't want to. It wasn't worth figuring yeah. out. If it's a problem yeah. worth figuring out, I know all of you. We're really fucking smart. And we yeah. all have a ton of fucking resources at our fingertips. We could figure shit out if we wanted to figure shit out. But at some point, it reaches that, like, this is no longer worth figuring out because it's no longer aligned with who I am. Have you guys all seen Inside Out, the first one? Oh, yes. Yeah. Inside Out 2 just came out. I just saw it on Saturday. And uh, one, no. yeah. Highly recommend. Me and two of my girlfriends were just bawling in the theater watching it. What I heard from all of us as well is that we didn't make what happened part of our identity. I feel like had that happened at a younger stage, maybe I would have made it part of who I was or I would have let it define me a little bit more. And we all know, especially, you know, Sheena and Jess with the subconscious stuff, like our identity becomes our glass ceiling inside of us. And so if we make that our identity, then we can never surpass that. Doing the work to detangle what happened versus like, this is who I am. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason why my company was or is called. It's funny. It's so interesting. As I'm talking to you guys, I'm realizing like I'm talking about my business as a was. This is very interesting because mm-hmm. I like didn't work on it for a month while I was on maternity. And I just started only taking back like a handful of private clients. And that's very just subconsciously. I'm just noticing myself. My business was my business was I'm like, oh, shit. Am I about to do it again? Um, I didn't close it last time. I pivoted it last time. But now I'm going to. Oh, I don't know. I sidetracked myself with that realization. Somebody else should talk because now I'm now I'm processing something. <laughs> well, I think there's an interesting part of not making it about your identity. But like I know for me, like I was grieving the identity that I had been making it about and that I had to let go. Yeah. Like it was like, oh, man, I have self-abandoned in this way for so long and it's actually served me in a lot of ways. There have been some payouts that I've been getting from it and I think sometimes we talk, especially in the world of self-abandonment, about, yeah, like, okay, start standing up for yourself and advocating for yourself and not abandoning yourself. And that's fucking scary. That's scary if you don't have that skill set and you don't know what it is. And so while it wasn't like specifically with Archipelago, the, the club, it was like it wasn't my identity to that. It was grieving the little girl that like abandons herself all the time and recognize like I was really breaking up and putting her to rest in a way that I had never been able to see or do before. And like that was the identity shift that was happening for me that I still get to be like, let's check in. Does anybody do parts work here? Yeah. Are you familiar with all the time, all day long? Really spend all day in my head talking to my parts. Yeah. Same. Uh, um, Just like Inside Out. I'm telling you that movie's really. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to see it. The identity piece is a big one. My company, this is where I was going to say before, now that my brain is back online. By the way, mommy brain is like a real fucking thing too. It's called worth to wealth because I originally, I I discovered that I was assigning my self-worth to my ability to create success. And those two things have to be coupled in order to ironically find true success. Otherwise, it's an externalized version of success. Now, if I were to think, for example about closing down worth to wealth or pausing it, whatever you want to call it. And I just built this big membership program right before I went on maternity. I put like blood, sweat, tears. I've made 50 hypnotic recordings, which is almost 400 pages of writing scripts and four years of subconscious transformation on this platform called Amplify. And it's so powerful and it works so well and people love it so much. And I was like, when I think about that, And I think about walking away from it or doing something else with it or turning it down now. I don't have the same fear about it that I did because I think of what Jordan was saying. Like I've walked 
I've walked close to that path or walked around that path or had friends who've done that now. I don't feel that identity thing. It's actually the opposite. Once you kind of rip the bandit off and do it once, if we were to do it again, you're kind of like, no, I'm doing this because I'm choosing to do this this time. And it's because I want to and I'm comfortable with it. And it's actually an empowering feeling than a disempowering experience, which is what I had last time. Like, Jordan, you're, you know, you're kind of like spinning out and spiraling down. I don't know. And you also get more creative about it. Like this time I would think like, oh, maybe I could get somebody to buy it or Mm -hmm. maybe somebody wants to just come in and run it. And I just give them a large chunk of the profits because I don't feel like marketing it, but it's just sitting on the shelf. You start to get more creative because your identity is not so woven in. It allows you to see more possibilities to build something that is around who you are now and the kind of life you want to live now, which is constantly evolving. I think, too, what I realized on the creativity piece is, yeah, you get more creative. And what I've also noticed is that my ego is way less. Like, I don't hear it as often because, again, when I was building at the speed at which I was building done in a day, your ego naturally is just like, dude, I'm a freaking boss. Like, are you kidding me? I have done some ish, okay? And you start to, again, oh, my my time is worth this much and all of that. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. And when I decided to descale, I also shed those layers of just like, oh, I've like done all these really big things. And therefore, my time is worth all this stuff. It's like, no, like, what's fun? Like, what's going to bring me joy? What is going to continue to allow me to create solutions for the problems that I love solving? I have had way less attachment to the price of things which I think also is interesting for me because I've always been very high ticket Mm -hmm. pretty much my entire business. Then to now be playing in this low ticket arena, and I'm talking like $200 or less, it's such an interesting playground that, again, my ego would not have even allowed for me to have done previously. And that's not saying that I can't do high ticket or it doesn't bring me joy, but just, again, the allowance of play between different playgrounds versus being like all high ticket or all low ticket or all this or all that now kind of are able to dip your toe in different waters without your ego being like, nope, that's not your water. You can't go over there. I've actually really enjoyed that. And it's been really refreshing for me. I'm sure probably people think I'm look totally insane to them because they're like, Jordan literally was like doing VIP days and high ticket stuff. Now she over here talking about this $99 thing. Like what is even happening? Like, I don't really care because I'm enjoying myself and I'm creating solutions that are fun and exciting and, and different in the space that I don't want to say I'm completely not a people pleaser, but it's definitely not as intense as it was before. I still want to be known for certain things uh, as a human and being kind and smart and those things. But I recognize like not everything I give to the world is for everyone. And so therefore, if that's true, there are some people who will not like it. And that's okay. And that means nothing about me. That means nothing about the direction I'm going. It just means that Again, just like I have to be gluten-free because I'm celiac, that doesn't mean if somebody eats pasta, I'm going to be pissed off at them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just that's so unnecessary. And I think to the Internet, and I don't know if y'all see this, the Internet has become such a not even opinionated, but it's almost like if I say that, you know, I'm celiac and I'm therefore not going to eat bread, that means that in my world, which again, this is not true. In my world, if you eat bread or if you eat pasta or cookies or cake, we cannot be friends. We cannot see eye to eye. You are a terrible person if you eat bread. It's like all this stuff. And when I simply said, I'm not going to eat bread or I can't eat bread, that means literally nothing about anybody who does eat bread. And yet the internet makes this drama, this like tornado hurricane situation around anybody who shares something about themselves that then people project that upon themselves or project that against the opposite of whatever you're saying to mean it's bad, wrong, evil, stupid, whatever the case is. And so that's where it kind of gets really tricky because it's like now I can't even talk about like my core values are who I am because now you're going to think if you're the opposite that you're a bad person. It's like, okay, well, the internet is the internet. Y'all, I am dead. I'm like looking at the time being like, holy shit, I did not realize we are at the end of our time. I This conversation has blown away oh. my expectations for everyone that's listening. You know, this is the first group interview for Big Goal Energy. And I looked up and I was like, oh my God, the timer says 45 minutes. Holy shit. How did we get to this point? I still want to talk about pressure. Jordan just brought up play. 
Like I have all these other things like you guys. Thank you so much. This episode has filled my soul and hopefully the souls of the listeners. Before we go, if you, just one quick thing. I would love for each of us just 30 seconds to say what's coming next for you, but not in your business, in your life. Because we talked about building a business around our life. And so let's end on what's good about our lives. I'm going to Colorado in a couple of weeks to watch my niece play in the national soccer tournament. She is 14 and she's absolutely crushing it in soccer. She got accepted to the Olympic team as well, like the Olympic yeah. development team. Development. Like mm-hmm. my sister on that. Like just wow. she's crushing it. And so to go back to Colorado where I lived for 10 years be friends and just be in community and watch her just literally crush her goals. I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. Oh, I am going to be moving in to said dream house with my husband and my bonus son. Super excited. I have an office that is almost 400 square feet to myself that I'm literally going to put a thumbprint lock on because these boys that I live with love them to death. And also, this is my piece of my sanctuary with my puzzles and my ability to podcast in silence. So that's what I'm really excited about is decorating that and having that space to myself. Cool. My husband and I are exploring essentially like where we want to live. And if it's going to be here in Raleigh, North Carolina long term, or if we may live in New Jersey or Philadelphia area where his family is, mm-hmm. or maybe splitting time. The next thing, the next big thing for me is I'm going to be with community in Asheville, North Carolina for a couple of weeks. And then we're going to spend two months up in Ocean City. He has a, a house in Ocean City, New Jersey mm-hmm. with his mom. So we're going to go and live for a couple of months up there and explore different neighborhoods and regions and decide is this something we want to do or not? Maybe rent something long term, maybe buy something. Taking our son, taking my nanny with us which is a whole new journey and adventure so that's kind of like the big thing that my attention's turned towards love it and mine is that we are getting married jordan and i and we are having a reception in october and so luckily there's not a lot of planning that goes into it thankfully we're super low maintenance I think the dress I bought was like $150 on one of those like Facebook ad, like internet dress website place. Like I'm no flowers. We're not, like, there's no nothing fancy. We just get to show up and enjoy our friends and family in a really beautiful way. Thank you all again for basically playing with me today and having this beautiful conversation. Mm-hmm. It far exceeded my expectations of not knowing what I was doing in starting this. For anyone that's listening, I have all of their contact info in the show notes, all the places. Thank you all so much, so much for joining us today. Thank you three for being the inaugural roundtable conversation and make sure y'all are subscribed so that you can get all of the future episodes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Big Goal Energy. We trust that it fueled your ambition and made you feel seen. We are a community of ambitious female entrepreneurs like you. Come join us in the Big Goal Energy community by visiting breeseeley.com slash community. In the meantime, send your questions for us to cover in the episodes to info at breeseeley.com. Together, we'll turn your audacious dreams into remarkable achievements. Cheers to defying reality. See you on the next episode.